Uh, good afternoon to everybody who's here. I hope you're well and uh, staying safe. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, you could join us today for what will be a very informative session. Uh, we have five excellent and respected speakers from the Mexican government, from trade groups, the legal profession, and industry. Uh, my name is Ralph Biederman, and I'm the executive director of the Mid-America chapter of the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce. A little bit about our history. Uh, our ch chamber is a binational organization with headquarters in both uh, Washington and Mexico City. Uh, the purpose of the chamber is to build mutually beneficial trade and investment relationships between our two countries. We were started in 1973 as a 501c6 nonprofit corporation. Today we have 20 chapters. 10 in the United States and 10 in Mexico with a total membership of over 550 companies and organizations. We have numerous groups and uh, uh, task forces such as the new North American Working Group uh, comprised of members that review and analyze trade issues and then provide uh, information and recommendations to the appropriate agencies of government of both countries. Since May of 2017, our chapter has held 13 uh, breakfast series sessions with members and friends to openly discuss trade issues and their impact on their organizations. And since uh, the end of uh, last year, we've provided many updates on issues to this growing group of concerned individuals in the Chicago land area. Uh, you can check us out at www.usmcocma.org especially our resources page where we uh, put uh, research and analyses and information uh, several times a week uh, for people to be able to use. Um, I'd like to uh, assure that everybody who is listening has uh, their computer audio on, but we would appreciate it if you would mute your mic and also uh, uh, mute your, your video. Before we begin, I'd like to thank uh, Baker McKenzie for sponsoring our webinars. We've had three in the past three months, and uh, this one today and the next two we're doing together with the ambassador and uh, her uh, staff uh, here in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, let me get out of this uh, sharing. And I will... Um, move the presentation over to uh, the ambassador. We just hold on a minute. Are you ambassador? Uh... Well, ambassador, I think uh, you have the uh, the podium now. I don't know if you have any uh, uh, presentations. If, if not, uh, please uh, start. And thank you very much for participating and also for getting uh, uh, Consul Fernando Gonzalez involved. Thank you so much, Prof. I really appreciate this opportunity. I apologize for the for the delay in connecting with, with the seminar. Uh, nowadays, the, 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 the rule of the day is to jump from one platform to the other. So I guess my, my desk computer went crazy when I changed uh, the, the platform. But unfortunately, because we have technology, I'm not now connected through um, my telephone, my mobile telephone. So um, I'm happy to be here. I really appreciate um, Ralph's initiative to continue talking about important issues for our business community, but issues that at the end of the day impact the lives of all of us. Um, I, I mentioned this before. Uh, I think one of the mistakes that the many stakeholders that um, were engaged or involved uh, with NAFTA made throughout those decades is that we didn't talk up enough about it. And um, we were very happy when we saw we USMCA um, uh, at, at the end of the line that, you know, now that it's approved and is the, the, the law of the land in the three countries, uh, we should continue the conversation. We, we need to make sure that that certainty that we all of us were looking into our economic exchanges um, you know, takes life in, in the different aspects that are important for our economies. So thank you so much, Rob, for this. Thank you to the U.S., um, Mexico-U.S. Chamber of Commerce, 
uh, Mid America chapter that hits Ralph so um, graciously. And thank you for your leadership in this in this matter. I'm just going to give gen a general of overview of what we are seeing here from the consulate. Connecta is also Rocio Rivera, which is the Council for Economic Affairs, and I'm pretty sure that many of you already have have had a chance to to meet with her. If not, um, I, I'm pretty sure that Rocio will be happy to listen to your concerns and to be of any help uh, if, if um, your different activities require uh, the intervention of the consulate to make things easier. Um, as I said, I want to talk a little bit about the Mexico-U.S. Uh, relation in general in terms of uh, our exchanges. You know that in 2019, for the first time in history, Mexico was uh, the first trading partner with the U.S. That has been, you know, back and forth, and now I, I think China is 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 again in number one. But what is uh, really important for us is that uh, over six hundred uh, billion U.S. dollars are exchanged with Mexico uh, between January and October two thousand and twenty. The total trade between the two countries surpassed uh, the four hundred and thirty-nine billion dollars. Um, this um, successful relationship despite what we are going through uh, today uh, related to the health crisis that we are living, um, reflects very well in what's going on uh, between Mexico and the state of Illinois. The trade relationship with Mexico generates almost 200,000 jobs in, in, in Illinois, and I'm pretty sure that that can be expanded. There is a lot of potential for growth in this, um, in this figure. Mexico is Illinois' third trading partner only after Canada and China, but we're the second export market of Illinois. Uh, so that, of course, says, and I keep repeating this, we are excellent clients. 66% of Illinois corn is uh, consumed in Mexico, and all the avocados, blackberries, grapefruit juice, and beer uh, that Illinois consumes comes from Mexico. So that speaks a lot of the dynamism of our uh, of course, as I said, um, COVID-19 have affected the the economic exchanges that we have uh, between the two countries and between the state uh, of Illinois and Mexico. Uh, from March to October 2020, U.S. exports to Mexico decreased in 23 percent, while imports from Mexico decreased 15 percent. On the other hand, Illinois exports to, Mex exports to Mexico decreased 32% where imports from Mexico decreased 9.3%. And th there, are, there are many explanations for these figures and how they are um, uh, mirroring what's going on in the context of COVID-19. Um, just to give you an example for, for, these, for these figures that I just mentioned. Um, Illinois exports of auto parts that is relevant for this, for this seminar to Mexico decreased 47%. Um, and Illinois export of corn to Mexico decreased 64%. On the other hand, medical instruments, the exports of Illinois of medical instruments to Mexico increased 18%. And what respects to Illinois imports, televisions and auto parts uh, imports from Mexico decreased um, less than 10%. But fruits and ethyl alcohol um, in one case, in the case of uh, fruits, 48%, and ethyl alcohol, 62%. So those are just um, some of the figures that I want to share with you. Um, so you can see how, uh, at the end of the day, what we are doing here today, and uh, this initiative that um, Ralph um, had, and started discussing with uh, Rocio, our Council for Economic Affairs, should be part of many, many conversations that we need to have in the future on different industries. In the, in the specific case uh, of today, uh, today's seminar that we're going to talk about uh, the Mexican auto industry, um, you know that this has been one of the most dynamic sectors in uh, our trade exchanges, that uh, it has been key in the um, development, strengthening, and renegotiation of NAFTA and they should continue uh, leading the way for um, for their uh, economic benefits in the in the three countries. So that's why I am I am very pleased. And Ralph, I think it's it's my job. It's going to be my job to introduce my my 
my dear colleague from um, our consulate in Detroit. Uh, that's precisely why uh, I thought it was very relevant to include in the conversation our consul um, in Detroit. He has been um, leading uh, this effort in the area to talk about specifically this kind of uh, changes. You know, uh, being Detroit is, is, is a no-brainer. He, he is in contact and he's in touch with industry in that region. And that's precisely why I'm really honored to have my good friend, Fernando Gonzalez Aif, the Consul of Mexico in Detroit. I'm gonna be very brief and just to give you uh, a general um, semblance of um, uh, bio of uh, my, my colleague. Fernando Gonzalez Aif, the Consul of Mexico in Detroit, in September 2017. Uh, so he was there when you know this conversation started on uh, the modernization of USMCA and he uh, led the way uh, in, in, in talking and spreading the word about the importance of this negotiation related to the auto industry. Um, prior to coming to Detroit, he was head of political and multilateral affairs at the Embassy of Mexico in Canada. He was deputy chief of mission at the Embassy of Mexico in Vietnam, deputy director for the United Nations Affairs at the Mexican Foreign Ministry, and he was liaison for congressional affairs to the House of Representatives at the Embassy of Mexico in the U.S. We both are alumni from from uh, uh, the the posting of. Um, being part of the political section in Washington, D.C. So we share um, the, the difficulties and the, and the pains that that um, is part that are part of, of that job being a liaison with Congress in our embassy in the U.S. Um, he uh, was also coordinator for Mexican participation in the U.S. Security Council. He's a career diplomat and he has a very wide experience in the academic sector. He, is, uh, he has a bachelor's degree in law from the Institute uh, Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México and a master's degree in law and diplomacy from uh, Fletcher. So I am really happy to pass the microphone to my, my dear colleague, Fernando González Aife. Ambassador, thank you very much for your presentation and your introduction of uh, Fernando. Uh, the, uh, the floor is yours, Fernando. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much, Reina. Thank you so much, uh, uh, and dear friends from the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce for Chicago, also known as the Mid-America Chapter. Uh, in another life, as Reina was saying, we were working together at the Foreign Ministry on multilateral issues dealing with human rights, with international peace and security. So I guess that we are both now, now that we're sharing this floor, talking about the auto sector, we're truly multitaskers. Um, um, I'm a diplomat. I was not part of the USMCA negotiation team. I don't work in the auto industry. So as a diplomat, I will reanalyze and we try to build consensus. And that is what I will try to attempt in, in three short, three-minute components. The first one, how did we get here? The second one, what is the current paradigm in the Mexico-US-Canada auto relation and its immediate consequences due to the pandemic? And three, trying to, trying to make a little bit of futurology and, and to see where our trade uh, relation is going to go now with the Biden administration. So let's start. As we witness uh, the last chapter of the Trump administration that actually didn't have a lot of faith on, on international trade on multilateralism, coupled with the worst pandemic the world has witnessed, which has wrecked the uh, business on all sectors, uh, we could easily sustain or have a very pessimistic view regarding our trade relation and how it affects the North American auto industry. But looking uh, things in a greater scope and acknowledging uh, how strong the roots of our trade relation have they ha have withstood the hard winds and the challenges it faced during the last four years, um, w w we can be a little bit more optimistic. Let's remember that one of the first acts of the Trump administration was to withdraw from TPP or the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement. And since the first days of the Trump administration, we all uh, read the tweets coming from Washington that NAFTA was the worst deal, uh, uh, trade deal ever made, that job losses in the U.S. could be blamed on NAFTA, that Mexico was the bad guy and a world would have to be built on the border. And then he shifted the blame on Canada and Prime Minister Trudeau, who is, who is such a nice guy, by the way. And with that very challenging background, our negotiators, I think they deserve a medal 
for having completed numerous rounds of complex USM uh, negotiations that finished the deal that was approved by the three legislators in the three countries. Three years ago, when our USMCA negotiations started, you would have anticipated that today, at the end of 2020, we would have updated NAFTA, incorporated e-commerce, agreed on higher environmental uh, and labor protections, and basically strengthened the auto sector. So what was accomplished? Without going into the nutshells, the very basic fact that the trade deal was upheld, it's huge. Many or most would have doubted that four years ago, today, the biggest true leader of USMCA would eventually be President Donald Trump himself. The signing of USMCA has removed uncertainty for investors, which is very important, and our value change in trade have been preserved. So yes, I would say that um, USM negotiations were a big soap opera with ups and downs, but it had a good ending. We did not maximize short-term politics over the long term of the economy, leaving behind all that we had advanced in creating in North America, uh, basically the most prosperous region of the world. And the main objective of NAFTA, now USMCA, which was to increase the flow of trade and goods and thus the creation of jobs has been accomplished. So what are some facts today regarding Mexico-US relations? Well, complementing what Ambassador Reina Torres said, today, Mexico is the first market for U.S. exports, larger than your exports to the U.K., to France, to Japan or Germany. We did agree when we started the negotiations that NAFTA was not perfect, that NAFTA needed a, a facelift. However, we did not undermine the fact that since the treaty was signed, U.S. jobs linked to trade with Mexico grew approximately from 500,000, so 700,000 to 5 million. So why was NAFTA improved uh, and upheld? First, from a political stand, we learned that there was a strong movement on the part of U.S. business leaders, farmers, state governors, legislators, universities, think tanks that came together to defend free trade with Mexico. Yes. Uh, it, it, and it sounds such a, uh, an, an obvious thing, but some, sometimes it doesn't. We discovered during the negotiations that the U.S. is more than Washington, D.C. And many voices in the U.S. came to the table to advocate in favor of NAFTA. And I saw that particularly from the Michigan area. The auto coalition in Michigan and the Midwest was so important. And they went to Washington and said that ending NAFTA, which underpins 1.2 trillion in annual trade between the three countries, would, would put the U.S. auto sector jobs at risk. At the end of the Trump administration, let's not forget something that's really, really important. USMCA is perhaps the only bipartisan deal the important deal struck between the Republican and Democratic parties. Number two, where are we now? COVID has hit and affected all business, including the auto industry. But in my recent talks here in Michigan with CEO car manufacturers, they tell me that auto sales are coming back and that production will recover from COVID, bearing future shocks, of course. The basic reason is that people want cars. Even in big cities with uh, important public transportation, more people are feeling safe in their cars now. Yes, it's very true that with all the lockdowns we faced, the number of miles that people drove uh, declined uh, this year. But we are witnessing the beginning of a lasting transformation that will not decline in the needs for people of having vehicles. We, of course, live and work in a different world after COVID. There was a short term effect on the miles driven, but I don't think it would be a long term. A year ago, I actually read a very interesting article in The Economist uh, predicting that the younger generations were moving away from owning vehicles and they will all uh, go to Uber. But now people are coming back to cars. And unlike in the Great Recession, automakers have not sought, sought federal assistance. And this is very important. And the auto industry in its majority uh, 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 supports USMCA. 
which provides stability in the North America vehicle production. As I mentioned, I've been talking uh, with executives tier one and tier two, uh, and, and I asked them if they already uh, were feeling an impact on the USMCA rules uh, on, the, on their factories, on their work, particularly the, the new rules that require that 75% of the vehicle's content be made in North America and 40% of the car content must be made uh, with workers earning uh, at least $16 an hour. I've been told that so far, that impact has not been felt. Imports and exports are flowing normally. Future production plans will, have, however, obviously, uh, uh, have to uh, comply on their probably a three or a five year phase period. Dan probably is an expert in this. And I anticipated, we anticipated that for 2021, CBP will apply an informed compliance period during which it will advise companies on how to correct errors rather than imposing punitive duties. The same, of course, with the Mexican customs. And of course, uh, uh, going back to the political aspect as well, we're not operating in a vacuum. Uh, we will have to see how the instrumentation of the agreement will be enforced under the Biden administration. We expect companies will have time uh, for compliance to ensure uh, that downstream suppliers are up to speed on the new rules. Second aspect is to analyze what has, what has been the impact uh, in the industry with COVID. When the pandemic hit the U.S., some U.S. states that were facing the lockdown of uh, closed car companies, including here in Michigan, well, Mexico at the beginning at that, at that stage remained open. The Mexican government faced a lot of pressure at the beginning to adjust its policies with the U.S. COVID calendar, but it withstood at the beginning and Mexican companies remained open until the curve started getting higher in Mexico. And when the pandemic was at its highest point in Mexico, uh, the value change between our countries was not in line. But promptly, the Mexican government declared that the auto industry was essential. And after agreeing with companies in security and health measures in their factories, they reopened. And as I understand, they are mostly working uh, a normal uh, uh, at the moment. The state of Chihuahua did open later, but entered the orange coronavirus here late in October, whereas the neighboring state of Durango entered before. The orange tier permits that important financial actions to proceed, which embrace the auto trade. Same thing happened with uh, Nuevo Laredo, with El Estado de Mexico, Guanajuato, Querétaro, that all, as you know, have important uh, U.S. car companies operating. That does not mean, of course, that if there's a hazard in the future or a future outbreak in a, in a big company, this will not disrupt orders from North America. COVID us is unpredictable. And yes, we have to keep an eye on Chihuahua bordering with the U.S. That could soon again go into the red light. However, regardless of the ocean of orange coronavirus on maps, both in the U.S. and Mexico, the North American trade continues ahead in response to what we're seeing is a strong client demand. And manufacturing, from what I'm reading, has been going ahead at a superb tempo. Also very important, in Mexico, both the federal and state government, governments are more than aware of the significance of the auto sector. And Mexico, under the local Obrador government, remains one of the most open countries in the world in terms of uh, free trade agreements, not only here in North America, but also with modern FTAs in Europe, in Asia, in South America. And today, since recovering from the shutdowns beginning in July, uh, uh, they tell me that we have now returned to virtually identical production ranges that we had at the second half of 2019. And the forecast uh, tell us that this month will probably be very close or even higher than in December 2019. The future. Doing futurology, of course, it's, it's not easy, but here are some facts. The U.S. cannot sell supply. There is more demand for light vehicles in the U.S. than U.S. producers can supply. U.S. light vehicle production is split between domestic and international firms. In Mexico and Canada, provide half of the U.S. light vehicle imports. 
and have were manufactured in Canada or Mexico. And very important, all vehicles imported to the U.S. from Mexico contain already approximately 40% of U.S. content. So every time that Mexico exports, not just to the U.S., but any part of the world, this is providing U.S. jobs, good-paying jobs. Under NAFTA, and now USMCA, another important consequence has been that we have seen a lot of international automakers from Asia and Europe building their plants uh, in our region, in North America, to take advantage of our preference. And uh, uh, NAFTA obviously made North America a complete auto region. Low and high wage jobs are distributed to optimal regional locations based on cost, based on capability, and proximity to critical assets. And USMCA maintains this paradigm. So my final thought, COVID has not just affected the global economy. It has changed the trajectory of the three big forces that are shaping the modern world. Globalization has been truncated, the digital, digital revolution has been accelerated, and the geopolitical rivalry between the US and China has in intensified. This means that we're no going back to the pre-COVID world. That probably will still be not obvious at the start of 2021, amidst the mystery of a resurgent second wave of the virus, attention in many countries will be on how to control it. And only as 2021 progresses and vaccines are rolled out, coming right now from Kalamazoo here in Michigan, will it be become clear how much has permanently changed. We already know that the post-COVID winners uh, include the tech giants and large companies that can adapt to the new circumstances including in the auto sector. Although impact will still be about goods and capital crossing borders, we can expect that people will travel less. Border restrictions and quarantines will stay in place long after COVID-19 falls. Mr. Trump will be gone, but probably American suspicion of China will not end. And the splintering of the supply chain in two parts, one Chinese dominated, and the other American-led will continue. Some Chinese companies in the other sector that wish to avoid present or future tariffs will try to produce their car inputs in our region. And actually now in Mexico, we are starting to see how Chinese are building industrial parks in our country. So what to expect from the Biden government? Behind the slogan of build back better, I think we're seeing a bold, but not a radical attempt to marry short-term stimulus with hefty investment in green infrastructure, in research and technology to accelerate, accelerate the U.S. energy transformation. The social contract proposed by Bidenomics is a 21st century version of a progressive era, bold reform without dangerous leftism. The U.S. will remain concerned about the threat posed by a rising China. But we can see that rather than attacking it with unilateral tariffs, Mr. Biden's team will focus on building on a multilateral coalition to counter China. Mr. Biden will be keen on repairing multilateral agreements and protecting existing jobs to push for the kind of change that is needed. And this is where USMCA fits with the, with the auto sector as the great motor to maintain and produce jobs in the U.S. in the North American region as a whole. So to conclude, I will say uh, that Mexico and the U.S. are united by nature, by geography and destiny. And today, Mexico and U.S. Uh, touch the daily lives of our citizens, whether by commerce, culture or travel. Our common prosperity and security depends on the type of relationship we develop in our North American region. And I perceive that the push will be in our civil societies and in our binational industries. And just as they protected our binational trade, included in the car industry, they will keep providing to be a basic force in moving governments forward in a shared North American vision. We can all keep uh, playing this role and keep strengthening our trade links, our people-to-people -people contacts, our culture, 
and our friendship. So I will end my remarks here. I hope I stayed in the 15 minute mark. Thank you. Fernando, you did. You did a excellent job in packing a lot of stuff in just 15 minutes and we very much uh, appreciate it. Uh, we're now going to hear from uh, Manuel Montoya. Manuel is president of the Automotive Industry Clusters Network of Mexico. He's general director of the Automotive Cluster of Nueva León, which is called Clout, and founding partner of the ENE Exceptores de Negocios. Uh, a, a Cloud is a civil organization composed of leading manufacturers of the automotive industry and also academic and government institutions related uh, to automotive. He also serves as a member of the Council of the Competitiveness, Competitiveness Institute, the Latin American chapter, as well as the Monterey Competitiveness Center and the tooling cluster of uh, Nuevo León. Uh, Manuel, I will turn it over to you. Uh, it's your floor. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the Chamber of Commerce for the invitation. I'm very glad to, to share some information with you. Maybe that can be some of some use. It will be useful for your uh, plans for investing in Mexico. Uh, I would like to share, but uh, not saying that I'm not loud. Huh? Uh, let me see. Uh, okay, I don't, I don't see this. So uh, it's not giving me the opportunity to. I don't know, Rafi, you can share my presentation. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, unfortunately, but let me try to find it. Okay, sorry for this inconvenience, but uh, I think my system is not allowing me to share it. Uh, but uh, if by chance you can find it, I, in the meantime, I can, I can share some information with you guys. Uh, uh, trying to to give a, a, a follow up of whatever Fernando had just tell, told us is uh, how is the industry in Mexico going on? Uh, as you may know, the, the industry in Mexico, you can divide it in three big regions. The north part of Mexico that have developed uh, during the 80s and mainly after the NAFTA signature. Uh, that uh, in those uh, states like Chihuahua, Nuevo León, Sonora, Coahuila, many OEMs have established operation and most of tier ones are established there. Is where my cluster is in one of these uh, 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 states. Then we have the old part of automotive industries more in the center of, of Mexico. Uh, and it's more based in, in the state of Mexico, Puebla, and uh, the state of uh, the, the district of federal or the old plants are there and the new plant of Audi is in the Puebla state and then you, you have the new new region what we call the Bajio region where many OMs established after the crisis of 2009 Mazda, Honda, Toyota, BMW uh, uh, has established operations in those states and all around them, a good number of tier ones. Uh, uh, before the, the COVID, uh, we, we have a production in Mexico around 3.9 million cars. Uh, that is quite important now uh, before, uh, because if you consider that in all North America, we are producing around 18 million cars is a, a, a good number. Uh, so, in this year of COVID, uh, uh, we, we have lost uh, production in the whole world and in the region of North America, we lost uh, around 3 million cars of production, 3.5 3 million cars we, we, we didn't produce during this year. So, what we are expecting is that we are going to close the year with a production of cars in, in North America, around 14 million. Of those 14 million, uh, 10 will be produced in the US, three will be produced in Mexico, and one in Canada. So more or less is in the rough numbers uh, of production in the, in the region. So what, but what we are, uh, what I'm telling, telling to you is uh, Mexico lost production, but maybe not as much as the other two countries. 
what we are expecting during the next two, three next years is that the production will, will uh, rise. We are not going to to reach to the 17 million cars to be sold in the US. Uh, we are expecting that maybe next year we are going to be around 15 million cars to be sold in the US. And in and in Mexico, we are going to to, so, to sell around 1 million cars. Uh, so what we are expecting is that the recovery will take place between two and three years for the whole production that we used to have before COVID. But uh, I think that will change a little bit the rules of the game. Sorry, Ralph, you couldn't find my presentation? <laughs> no, unfortunately, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. For, uh, for we're going to make sure that everybody receives it anyway, so I'm, I'm, I apologize. Okay. okay, so you will have this, all this data with you. Uh, what, what I, I, I wanted to, to, the main idea I wanted to share with you all, guys, is that even if we are going to produce less cars in the region than before COVID, we are going to produce more content for those cars. Why? Because the new USMCA agreement is increasing the percentage of regional content from 60.5 to 75. That's one of the five rules of the, T the USMCA for the automotive sector. I know that I think Dan will, will explain this a little bit more after my presentation, but just to have an idea, uh, we're going to, to, to increase the regional content. I mean, the North American content for all our vehicles will increase 12.5 in the next four years. This year, the regional content has increased from 62.5 to 66. Next year, we'll, meet, we'll move to 69, then to 72, and then to 75%. So this 12.5% of all the cars, of the content of all the cars produced in North America, today are, is being produced in Asia or Europe. So all this content will have to be produced by someone in Canada, the US, or Mexico. That's the big, the very big opportunity that we all have in the three countries that we are here today. And I think in our case in Mexico, we have a great opportunity because we have certain advantages having the, this, uh, all these asset plans already established in Mexico. Uh, one is that the OMS has to increase their, their regional content. But the USMCA have new rules for the tier ones. This is new uh, in comparison with the NAFTA treatment. In this USMCA agreement, the tier ones have now to comply with certain percentage of North American content. From my point of view, one of the scenes of the NAFTA treatment was this that there was a, not a rule for the tier ones so they keep importing everything from asia or from europe and they were not uh, forced to to develop their tier two supplier base in the region so this didn't ha help us during these last 25 years to have a more uh, a more consolidated uh, industry in our region but today the usmca is forcing us to increase the content of, of, of tier two uh, components in our cars and our tier ones. So the tier ones have a new rules that will uh, make them to, to comply with 60, 65, 70 or 75% of their regional content. So for, uh, for us uh, in, in Mexico, if, if you come to Mexico, you will not find a lot of tier twos based here in Mexico. And the reason was, is that uh, we, we didn't have, we didn't, our tier ones were not forced to develop their super in Mexico. But now the opportunity for our tier two supply base is to increase their, their, their production for our tier ones and the opportunity to establish new tier tools in the region. 
even no, uh, American companies, tier two companies that maybe today they are supplying for the U.S., they have the opportunity to supply from Mexico if they establish their operations here. The opportunity is that many tier, many tier ones, mainly Asiatic and Europeans, keep importing components from Asia and from Europe. And for those American tier tools that they want to establish operation in Mexico, they will have the opportunity to grab that market that today is being supplied from Korea, from China, from Japan, from Germany. So for tier tools, the, uh, the North American tier tools, that today they don't have operations in Mexico, the opportunity is if they come here, they will, can, they will grab that market that today is being supplied from Asia and Europe. So the, the big message, and I think in this uh, seminar, this webinar is now we have the opportunity to have more business in the automotive industry because the USMCA is putting us on the table to have more business. We had to, to, to supply from Mexico, from the US to our OMs and tier ones. Before the Asiatic and European companies will establish operations here because some of them, they will not like to, to, to finish their business in, in North America. So we'll, they are already planning to establish operations in one of our three countries. And I can tell you, uh, we have been receiving companies from Europe and Asia, especially Chinese companies, they are willing to establish operations in Mexico because they know that the, the, the market opportunity is there. This 12.5% of 18 million cars is quite interesting business for them. And that opportunity is also for us. So let's try to work together and try to supply especially between Mexican, American, and Canadian companies to all our uh, production base in, 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 in this region. So just to finish, uh, I, I would like to, uh, well, all this information is in my presentation that Raul will, will, will share with you. But uh, my last uh, message to you is tell you that the automotive cluster in Nuevo León and the network of automotive clusters in the country is willing to help your companies to establish operations here. We are non-profit organizations, so what we are going to do, we are going to put you in contact with professionals, uh, their businesses to help companies to establish operations, uh, so that you can you can have a local help to establish and, uh, and start up your operations. We have uh, clusters in 11 states in the country. Manuel, I think we may have lost. Manuel, can you hear me? I think uh, Manuel dropped off for some reason. So uh, uh, at any rate, uh, I think he has given a, uh, an excellent presentation. And uh, you know, what I'd like to do now is to uh, uh, turn it over to, uh, to Dan. Um, sorry, let me see. I'm here again. Sorry. Well, okay, I there you are. <laughs> sorry for, uh, excuse me, uh, a small connection problem here, but uh, now I, I am just finishing my presentation. No, okay. I was telling you. Yeah, uh, uh, why don't you finish it? Yeah, yeah. Just, just to tell you that uh, we are uh, we're happy to help you if you want to establish operations in Mexico in one of our 11 clusters, automotive clusters. And if you need any more information from my side, please contact me directly or uh, with the help of Ralph. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you for your body. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Manuel. And now I'd uh, like to introduce uh, Daniel Urzo. Uh, Dan is an international trade and transportation lawyer who specializes in particularly Canada, United States, and North American matters. He's a licensed attorney one of the few individuals who has served in the U.S. and Canadian governments, as well as private practice and uh, academia. Uh, he's president of the Ohio Canada Business Association and serves on the boards of the American Chamber of Commerce in Canada and a North American strategy for competitiveness, which is called NASCO. 
Uh, Dan, uh, take it away. We, we have asked you, because all of the uh, webinars that you've already done leading up to the USMCA, uh, to give us a little bit of a feel as to what's been going on in the last few months as far as the implementation of the trade agreement is concerned, especially in regards to automotive and the new rules of origin. So if you can do that, that would be fantastic. Dan, it's uh, up to you now. Okay, um, can, can you guys see the presentation that I just put on or? We can. Yep. Okay, the only, thing, the only interesting part is I cannot. So that's uh, kind of a funny, funny part of this. But in any event, uh, let me just thank you. Um, thank you, Ralph um, and, and USMCC in the, the Mid-America. In Mid it's a privilege to be here with the uh, ambassador as well as uh, my good friend from Detroit, the, the consul and, and Manuel and Paul. I'm actually gonna stop sharing there for a minute because I can't seem to see it myself. So what I'll do is I just wanna build off of Manuel's excellent presentation uh, and then quickly turn it over to Paul, who is doing exactly uh, what we're talking about here today. So I'm kind of the nerd stacked between uh, a bunch, several very interesting presentations. Let me just say, you know, it, it seems like we've been dating USMCA forever and a day now. Um, it, but in the great scheme of things, it's only been a year um, since the deal was actually done. We started dating in 2017 and 2018 the deal as AMLO and EPN passed each other on the door and then it sat for a year and it wasn't until I think it's almost to the day today so this is a credit to Ralph's planning um, that the House Democrats agreed to the deal that is now USMCA and then Mexico quickly ratified the US and then Canada in March and there has been a very short window of time between um, that March, and then of course we all know what happened in March, the world basically stopped. And then um, July 1st when USMCA came into force. And that's a credit to government officials in all three countries that got us up to speed with the implementing rules because it's, I don't wanna say it's easy to strike a trade deal, but we got through that part, but the hard part is actually implementing it. And I think, you know, they actually deserve a great deal of credit, our, our friends in government, including those on the line today. Um, now, USMCA was a bit like a 2020 wedding. Um, it came, we had, we're formally hitched on July 1st, but we didn't have the party or the celebration, right? And that's that's pretty much how it's been for everybody. And, and the honeymoon that we received after July 1st was U.S. Customs and Border Protection, um, along with their counterparts in Mexico and Canada, are calling the period we're in now from July 1st until the end of this month, phase one. It's a period of maximum flexibility, good faith, the way that I described this to our, our great clients, and I'm sure our friends at Baker McKenzie and elsewhere are saying, you know, this is uh, the no jerk rule. As long as you're not being doing anything wrong or fraudulent. Um, right now, you're, you're basically being told, okay, you're not quite there, but get into compliance. But that all ends at the end of the month, um, at least theoretically. So we're gonna see as we go in to 2020, some 2021, excuse me, some heightened enforcement. Now, Manuel gave an excellent presentation, and, and I think he's exactly right. So what, what happened from that period of March until now, and, and I'm mindful of the time here. So let me just say companies, all the OEMs um, had to, and the tier ones, but particularly the OEMs, they had to do exactly what Manuel said, figure out how do I take our vehicle from 62.5% to 75%? How do we know what are our core parts, principal and complementary parts are? How do we determine labor value content, the $16 an hour rule? And then the 70% thresholds on steel and aluminum. And those, and the only way to do that was to reach out to the supply base. So from basically this time last year through Labor Day, I would say, we worked with thousands of suppliers to get ready because the OEM sent out, many of you likely received these. Um, usually they were an Excel spreadsheet or a database that their customs broker sent you and said, tell us we're in compliance with USMCA. So what 
a number of suppliers did, and again, many we work with, this was a good time to say, hey, are, is that product that we've been shipping for 20 years, is it still the same product? Or have we changed sourcing and others? So do we have this properly classified under the customs codes? And now, once we know that, what are the new rules? Is it 75%, is it 70%, is it 65% as core, principal, complementary, et cetera? And then, once, and then are we valuing that, right? Are, so working with our financial teams, are, are we valuing our products correctly under the USMCA rules? And a number of companies did that and are ready to go. Now, I can tell you in working with those, a lot of companies now, nobody had it right at the beginning. Every single company has at least had to tweak. Many had to transition, and some had to transform their supply chain. And so those companies are ahead of the curve right now or at least where they should be. We also found a lot of benefit in USMCA for companies down the chain in the polymers, chemicals, paints, coatings. USMCA, there's some brilliance in it. And companies are going into it and realizing, yes, there's some hard choices to be made to get to 65% or 70% or 75%, but there's also some benefits along the way as well. Some of those hidden things that didn't make it to the headlines if you're importing raw materials into North America, we've made it very easy to do processing, compounding, mixing, all of those types of things that should, as Manuel was saying, really help those tier two and down the chain so that we're not relying on semi-finished products from around the world, including China. And then, you know, so, but I will say, so that's the good news. The downside is there's about, I would say, a third of the auto suppliers <coughs> that just filled out the form and didn't do the analysis. And hope, hopefully those aren't my clients. But the reality <laughs> is, is that as we move into the first quarter and second quarter of next year, those are the companies that are gonna start finding some, some pain points. And the reality is, is they're not gonna be in their programs much longer uh, because the OEMs and tier ones aren't waiting around. So if, if that is you, the, the major difference between USMCA and NAFTA is that you have to show your work. You can't just say, I, we were good under NAFTA and now we're good in USMCA. You actually have to show that you have the analysis. It's not about a certificate of origin anymore. It's about certification of origin. It's a verb, meaning that you have to show what you're doing. And so that's it. Now looking very quickly, and I wanna turn it to Paul. If that's the first piece where we are, the second part is the most significant change that we're going to see in the coming weeks, months, and, and likely years is around labor. Now, you, there's two parts of USMCA around labor. One is that labor value content, $16 an hour. And that was misreported in the media many, many times as now the minimum wage is $16 an hour in Mexico. That's not true. The reality is that the OEMs have to look at their supply chain and say roughly 40% of our automotive parts need to be made with wages that are $16 an hour or higher. That largely means the U.S. or Canada, and to some extent, Mexico. And what we've seen, interestingly, was that particularly foreign automakers like the Japanese basically said, we can't move enough around into the U.S. and Canada, so we're just going to raise wages in Mexico. I think that was somewhat of an unexpected result. The reality was the intended result was that the supply chain, the, the tool and die folks, the molding companies, et cetera, that are in Windsor, that are in Cleveland, that are in places like that, that they're not gonna follow the rest of the supply chain. So that we would have some balance in North America. And so we'll see how that plays out over time. But the most common question I get today is we've done our analysis under USMCA, but we're not paying $16 an hour. Do our goods still qualify? If you're the auto supplier, that doesn't matter for you. It's only the OEMs that have to certify labor value content. Where it is important for you is your customers going to be asking, because the only way the OEMs can find out that information is to send the surveys to you. And there are surveys going out right now, and that's what's happening in the system. So you do need to know that, but that doesn't mean you stop shipping your goods. You have to get your hands dirty on that to satisfy your customer. Now, the other piece of labor, and this is where I'll end and, and transition over, is that um, and this isn't just for automotive companies, is Mexico's labor reform. Mexico's undertaking the most significant labor reform in North America since the New Deal in the United States. This is not about a politician. This is not about policy. 
because we've all heard these things in the past that this is going to happen and it never does. This was the Mexican people, and many of you on this line are very familiar with this, that decided several years ago we're going to reform the Constitution and have new labor reform and labor management relations. That is now enforceable through USMCA. That's exactly a year ago what House Democrats in the U.S. wanted, this rapid, uh, rapid response labor enforcement mechanism. And so what I expected was by now we would have already seen a labor case brought against Mexico, that AFL-CIO said that they were going to bring him by September 30th. Election and COVID got cut up, and interestingly, the first dispute we have under USMCA out of the barn is with Canada and dairy, pun intended. But I anticipate that we will see some issues around labor uh, with Mexico, and it's not just autos, it's for all companies, probably by the end of the first quarter this year, second quarter. What can you do right now is you need to start preparing for that and understand that this is a real issue. Labor reform in Mexico is not going away. And it is something that, uh, you know, we heard earlier, a progressive agenda by the Biden administration. The Biden administration will not be able to do anything else on trade until they take USMCA labor enforcement mechanism for a spin. And so Democrats in Congress will require that. So nothing else will happen on trade until we see that come into play. So as a company, you need to prepare for that, those, those labor issues. There's a scorecard that CCE, uh, Business Coordinating Council, has sent around. I do urge you to look at that scorecard if you're getting it. A lot of the OEMs are sending it out. But please don't fill it out without labor or without legal counsel or at least your HR people. It's going to folks in purchasing. It's a big Excel spreadsheet, and it asks for a lot of legal conclusions. And if you're on the receiving end of that, it says it's confidential, trust me, there's no confidentiality or privilege around that. Very last point, I'll just end where Manuel did as well. I'm very bullish on what USMCA does for the North American auto industry. Number one, it increases the content requirement from North America, and it'll have those effects down here, as, as Manuel said. Number two, we're going to have disruption with labor, but on the back end of that, that'll actually make us more competitive in North America if companies get in play. And last but not least, I spend a lot of my time working with advanced technology vehicle manufacturers, so electric vehicles, and we all know the names of those companies. It is virtually impossible and will be impossible in the next several years as USMCA is fully phased in to make electric vehicles with components, particularly the cells from outside of North America. That cell production will need to be done here, including the components, the mining, the lithium, and all of those types of things. And so USMCA has really positioned North America to make the vehicles of the future. And so with that, I'll turn it over uh, back to you, Ralph, to turn it over to Paul, who's in fact doing that very thing. So thank you for your time. And I'll, Ralph, I'll send that presentation over to you to share with folks as well. It's basically the Cliff Notes version of what I've just said. Thank you. Dan, we will get that out to people immediately, and uh, thank you very much for your, for your insight. And I know you've been working with uh, old clients and new clients as, as we're going along here, and it's not surprising that, you know, we're finding some uh, people that are still uh, behind the curve and have to catch up. Uh, let me introduce uh, Paul Tutenbach. Paul is the Vice President of Sales for ASYST, a global supplier of automotive plastic components and assemblies headquartered right here in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, its proprietary product lines will expand production of a new green field in San Luis Potosi. Uh, Paul has spent his entire career in the automotive industry in a variety of uh, roles and uh, has uh, been named on 22 patents. Uh, so other than selling, he's also developing. Uh, Paul, take it away. Thanks very much, Ralph. And thanks for all the previous speakers as well. Quite insightful. Um, so, uh, Ralph, I think you need to throw me the ball because I see that it's at Dan right now. All right, just a second. Sure. There you go. I am now the presenter. So I am going to, you tell me if you see my screen or when I, when you see my screen, if you could please. Share content. How about that one? Can you see this? Yes, I do. If you just uh, yeah, you're doing a presentation. If if you just go to uh, to view it, there you go. 
Great. So I have a few minutes here, and I uh, really appreciate, again, uh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce putting this together. It's quite an honor to, to be speaking to all of you now, and hopefully we can do this sometime uh, in 2021 face-to-face, -face, actually. Um, so a little bit of the background. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the intro that Ralph gave, a little bit more about who ASSIST is and what we do. Uh, as mentioned, we're a, a supplier of components and assemblies. We consider ourselves a tier two supplier, uh, assuming that since uh, some of our previous speakers, especially Dan was saying about uh, tier one and, and actually uh, Manuel is mentioning it as well, uh, the tier ones and the OEMs, uh, we're typically a tier two and shipping to a tier one, although we engage with the OEMs directly as well on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, we've been around since, uh, two th excuse me, 1996 uh, in this position here in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, smack dab between Milwaukee and Chicago. Uh, I put, put it on the map here for uh, any of those in, in uh, Mexico that might not know what, what a Kenosha is. Although a few months ago, we became uh, uh, globally known. Uh, unfortunately, the, the community of Kenosha had a few issues going on uh, during the COVID and the Black Lives Matter issues. So uh, we did hit uh, global headlines. Um, we are primarily an automotive supplier. About 10% of our business is medical as well. Uh, but because we're both automotive and medical, we consider ourselves essential. <clears throat> during the whole COVID shutdown, we were open uh, since uh, since March. So I've been coming to the office uh, on a on a daily basis ever since then, ever since the, sh uh, the normal shutdown. Clearly, we're global. We ship to 20 countries and, and actually five continents. We ship a lot to Asia. Uh, we actually ship about 20% of what we do currently goes to Mexico. So it kind of made sense that we wanted to be in Mexico and being close to our customers. Uh, our primary capabilities are plastic molding, and we've grown considerably in the last uh, 24 years and now have 42 injection molding machines. And we actually build our own automation cells. So we have robots and conveyor lines and such. So we have um, uh, 30 assembly cells that we do this. And because of the competitiveness of labor, the cost of labor, and just getting labor, it's essential that we have this kind of automation uh, in Kenosha, but we're also considering to put this automation in Mexico as well. Uh, I should underline here, it's not in the presentation, but our decisions to go to Mexico are not to go for low cost labor, it's to supply and support our customers and to grow our business. Uh, this is a kind of an expose of what our product lines are. About 70% of what we do are, are used in automotive headlamps, uh, but we have a lot in engine and powertrain as well as uh, airbag systems. And the tier ones that, that are making headlamps and making airbags are the guys that we are supplying. Um, you see this kind of uh, thing right in the middle. It's kind of a long uh, shaft. It's a plastic uh, assembly that's, um, that helps aim the headlamp. So we have a lot of proprietary products that are used uh, primarily so we can aim the headlamps. So every uh, lamp that is made in, in anywhere, really anywhere in the world needs to be aimed. And so we have uh, the pleasure of, of providing those types of products. Um, not only being a, a large automotive company, we're also a joint venture. We're a 50-50 joint venture between a German company called AOT, which is headquartered north of uh, Frankfurt, Germany, about an hour and a half north. And uh, our, our, our American parent is a ATF, and the, actually the chairman of ATF is, uh, is joining us as well. Uh, the Cerber family has owned ATF since the, uh, the early 1980s. Uh, and so there's been a long, long family relationship, a long business relationship between AIA and ATF over many, many decades. And that relationship spawned the joint venture that was started in Kenosha uh, in 1996. Uh, and that continues on as we want to expand. So we're gonna, this will be a nice expansion. The first time either of these organizations have had a joint venture that's actually expanded. Uh, so we have the pleasure of doing that and, uh, and the learning process of doing that as well. 
So why do we want to expand? And I mentioned it briefly uh, uh, in a few moments ago, but we have a number of customers that are global, and a number of those customers are already in Mexico as well as in Brazil. Um, we ship to them currently. And so we, when we were thinking about moving to Mexico, we realized that even a year ago, uh, I believe it was in February of last year, that Mexico and Brazil signed a free trade agreement that really cuts almost to zero the duties uh, and tariffs between Mexico and Brazil. Currently, we ship to Brazil and we ship X work, so we're, we're, we're not absorbing or being affected by those costs. But from our, a competitive standpoint, we are affected because our Brazilian customers have to pay as much as a 35% tariff on the products we sell to them. That goes away if we ship them from Mexico. So we're establishing our, our operation not only to supply Mexico, but also Brazil. Um, we're targeting to use, as I mentioned, to use the same type of product and the same type of processes that we're doing uh, in the US with automation and with molding. Uh, but why do we want to expand into San Luis Potosi? Well, there's a couple of reasons that are really kind of basic. One is that uh, it's a, a great central location. There's a lot of our, we actually have a couple of our customers directly uh, in SLP. We'll be 15 minutes away from them instead of uh, 15 or more hours. Uh, but there's also a great infrastructure for those who have not yet been to SLP. You'd be, you'd be pleasantly surprised about the high uh, amount of technology that's there. BMW has a big plant there, GM has a big plant there. Uh, we were a little bit concerned about, uh, would we able, be able to find labor uh, because we have our customers and the big OEMs are there, and we haven't seen that yet. We've seen some really good labor resources uh, at our disposal as well. Uh, but another great reason for going there is that now, we have a sister division. It's another joint venture between AATH and ATF that was established 13 years ago. Uh, and this company is called AATH ATF Fasteners de Mexico. We call them EFM, as uh, the acronym, acronym would be spelled out. Uh, Paulo Texera is the president of EFM. He's on this, uh, at, at this meeting as well. And I can't say enough about Paulo and his team uh, on how they've helped us uh, and, and taught us the things we need to know, and they keep teaching us. Uh, we had some great uh, learning sessions last week in my visit uh, down there, even with things about transportation, um, the banking structures and such that they've been very helpful uh, with getting us established, which is allowing us to focus on the product and the process and the commercial aspects while we can share other aspects such as HR, IT, accounting, and logistics. So it's been a really um, very more simplified way for us to uh, to join this. And if anybody wants to, to do that, I would expect them to do that as well. Uh, some of the details about what we're doing, um, uh, the EFOM sister division is already um, have a couple of plants now in the Millennium Industrial Park in SLP. And the Owner, architect, landlord of this industrial park is an organization called Argo. And I can also not say enough about this organization as well. They're really a gem. Um, they have been with us side by side with designing and developing our plant. It's really a greenfield site, but we're attached physically to uh, the EFM building, but we have actually expanded upon an expansion that they did. Uh, but it's Greenfield from a standpoint that we were able to select everything we, we needed to do um, from very basic to very uh, technical uh, to make sure that we had the right product and processes available to us. As you can see in the slide, we're about 23,000 square feet, but it was important to know that we would be able to expand in the future uh, to uh, to expand and double, double that fact because we didn't really know how quickly and how fast we would be able to grow. We're confident of the growth. We just weren't sure of how much we wanted to start with. So we're starting at uh, 23,000 square feet, hopefully expanding in that in a couple of three, a couple of three years. Uh, we're already planning. We, we have in a couple of weeks, our first four molding presses will be installed. We have another three that are scheduled uh, mid-year this year. And as I mentioned, we're, we're uh, building automation lines here and we'll be shipping those down 
over the next few weeks as well. Um, the, not to go through this whole timeline, but to impress upon you what was really impressed upon me is what Argo did as our owner, landlord, contractor, developer. Uh, we met with them a year ago and started talking. We made a decision, hey, let's do this business. Uh, they came up with a design uh, actually pretty quickly. They started construction the same week that uh, the um, the art that the uh, COVID shutdown was happening. And our first concern was, what is that going to do with our construction? And Argo didn't miss a beat. Uh, they were on time. They said they'd finish in October. We took the keys over a couple of days before Thanksgiving. They were on time and in budget, and we were amazed, quite amazed. It's a, actually a beautiful building. Um, and, and again, we've been finding great staffing. Uh, we early on hired our operations manager, uh, who is actually visiting here uh, this this week uh, up in Kenosha. Uh, but we hired him back in, in April. We hired a sales manager in July. And then we hired started hiring technical staff a few weeks ago, and we've been training them all along as well. And I guess to impress upon you, in a, in a year's time, we're going to be in production. And most countries in the world, even the United States, to get something done that quickly and that efficiently, uh, you'd be hard-pressed to do. A few slides to show you. Um, this is not an artist's depiction. It's not, uh, it, it hasn't been uh, airbrushed with a beautiful blue sky. This is a photo from just a few weeks ago. Uh, as the, the building was been done and completed on a beautiful sunny day, and that's what it looked like last week when I was there as well. Here's a uh, an overhead view, and you can see in the uh, upper right-hand corner is how we're attached to the uh, Ethan building. We have about a third of the building of this entire uh, block, and about two-thirds is uh, uh, for Ethan. This shorter building attached in the front is our office, and uh, that's the entryway as well. That's a couple of stories. Um, and then one of the things that was really impressive to me, uh, our operations manager, along with the uh, EFM HR people, organized this as a blessing for the uh, for the new plant. And this was just uh, two days ago on Saturday, uh, where we had a very nice presentation. Uh, the priest came through, blessed the office, blessed the, uh, the plant. We're just about to put uh, our equipment in there. So this was done ahead of time. And it, that's also impressive to me because we wouldn't normally see this in the United States as well. This was their idea and they did it. We're building a nice team. There's a few of us there. Um, and we've uh, even uh, done that without masks. Uh, uh, give you an idea of some what some of our products that we're moving down there. We've had some great growth already uh, with our customers. Our customers are also excited that we're going to be uh, joining them there. And then I'm going to end with a couple of slides here because uh, Ralph asked this really to talk about uh, USMCA and, and COVID. And I just wanted to give a couple of highlights of what the, our lessons learned have done. We've had some really pleasant lessons learned, as I mentioned, uh, working with our architect, working with AID ATF. They're just both the architect, AID ATF, uh, great partners in all of this. Uh, and everybody is there just really willing to help. Uh, and not wanting us to learn it all on our own, but really uh, very supportive to help us out through all of this. And really, too, uh, I would say this to anybody in the world, uh, the Mexican people, uh, the, tech, the, the technical aspects that they have, it's really quite amazing. And we shouldn't be amazed, uh, but it's been it's so enlightening to know that there's uh, very, how do I want to say the, the the team that we have? They're so encouraged to be part of this ground floor uh, growth of a new company. Um, and when I was out last week with them, and we took uh, the team out to dinner, and they've expressed how happy they are to be part of a greenfield startup as well. So what we would think would be important for us is important for the whole team as well. Uh, some challenging lessons learned. Uh, I won't uh, belabor this, but. My gosh, we learned so much about regulations. Um, and some of this was uh, dragged out because of COVID and the Mexican government, uh, as well as the US government and the, uh, the consulates were all shut down in Mexico. So getting some of the basic things we would think we would need 
took a lot longer uh, to accomplish just because the offices were closed and the governmental offices were closed. Uh, we're getting through all of this. Uh, we've learned to be patient. Um, our, our colleagues at uh, AI ATF have really helped us out with all of these issues as well. And so now we're flying. Uh, we're, we were concerned, would we be able to import our new equipment that we're buying from various places around the world? Some of our equipment is coming from Europe. And we were concerned if we'd be able to import it if we didn't have our export license. Well, we just got it two weeks ago. So everything's happening. Uh, but of course, then we've also learned that there's a 16% VAT tax on everything. So uh, just the things we get to deal with. Uh, so to end up on a couple of slides here, uh, what is COVID in a USMCA? Well, really, COVID in the US and in Mexico is really the same. The impact that we've seen, uh, if you're in Mexico, we're feeling the same in the US. And if you're in Mexico, you, uh, if you're in the US, you see the same in Mexico. Uh, it's been challenging to have face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, I've traveled twice uh, since Mex uh, since uh, March, and that is both times to go to Mexico. Uh, and that was in October, and that was on last week as well. Uh, so that's challenging, but really we've been, we have a thing called Assist Cares that uh, we've done as a team led by our HR uh, because we have to care for our employees and their families. So uh, we're doing the same, and our, our colleagues in, in SLP are doing that, we know substantially. Uh, so you have to be prudent in making sure that you're keeping everybody safe. Um, I don't need to really add anything from the USMCA uh, from my esteemed colleagues that were talking earlier. We really see this as a, a positive benefit. And uh, we were not waiting really for USMCA to be uh, signed. We were very, very happy that it was signed last December uh, and then implemented in, in July. Uh, because it really underscores why we want to be there. And we think it's only going to help us uh, as well and help our customers. Um, if it if it stayed on as uh, NAFTA, that would have been fine as well. Uh, if neither one of those happened, we still would have gone. Um, but because we see this as a positive benefit for our growth uh, and into the future. Uh, so with that, I want to thank uh, Ralph. Thanks uh, everybody for attending and listening to me. Hopefully I wasn't too boring. I wish uh, everybody a uh, Feliz Navidad and a uh, Merry Christmas. And Ralph, back to you. And Ralph, you are on uh, mute, I believe. Sorry. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for a great <laughs> presentation. and. Uh, uh, coming at the end, uh, so great because uh, of all the hard work your company has done. Uh, but let me get into a little bit on the uh, COVID-19 and the USMCA. Uh, when you put your critical path together back last November on doing this, uh, we didn't even know what COVID was. Uh, and we knew that there was going to be a new trade agreement, or we thought there was going to be. Uh, we didn't know all the details, especially what was going on with the rules of origin and the original value content, the regional labor content. Let's look at COVID first. Um, again, it wasn't on a critical path, but it came along. And obviously at some point in time, not only from what you were seeing and feeling on the ground there, but what you were hearing about what the government wanted to do in making some industries essential and others unessential, um, you know, obviously that had to be put into the planning. Uh, obviously, your uh, uh, your parents, uh, AOT and ATF, uh, you know, had experience on the ground, but they just like you were going through COVID at the same time. W what have you done as an organization or organizations, both yourself and your parents, uh, to plan properly uh, for keeping people safe, as you had in your last slides? Uh, so, good question. You know, the entire. Uh, automotive industry obviously was affected. Obviously, the whole, uh, the whole world's been affected. There was a lot that was done. Uh, there was a lot of resources that were available uh, from OEMs um, as well as from uh, Tier 1s. Uh, Lear Corporation, for example, would put out uh, examples of what they were doing. Uh, so they weren't uh, keeping it to themselves, but sharing it to the to the supply base as a whole with suggestions of uh, of what's needed to do. I don't. It's uncanny in how many 
uh, webinars, uh, Zoom meetings, um, uh, Teams meetings that we were in uh, from conferences that were being offered um, by OESA, for example, that would suggest uh, here's issues that need to be addressed. Some of it was from an economic standpoint and some of it was from a self, uh, health and safety standpoint. Uh, so we uh, attended a lot of those and made sure that we were fully informed and that we could be flexible and react to what needed to be happening. Um, and some of it is the obvious things that we're all doing now, wearing masks, but we did a lot from a, a cleaning standpoint uh, and making sure we had uh, education and awareness down to the plant floor uh, on a regular basis to make sure everybody was uh, uh, aware of what needed to happen. So, uh, Ed, you know, you're not started up yet, but uh, I, I was just wondering if uh, AOT and ATF uh, had a period when they were not operating. Uh, yes, uh, they uh, there was uh, I don't know the exact time frame. I, uh, Paulo could jump in if he needed to, um, but there was legally a time where uh, they had to shut down. They attempted to continue to run, uh, and then they were concerned about being um, having fines uh, from the SLP government or from the city of SLP. Uh, if they didn't comply with the shutdown. So there was some time that they did have to shut down. Um, the, uh, the parent ATF uh, also had some time to shut down as well. Some of that, though, was specifically because the orders dried up. Every, everybody stopped. From our standpoint at ASSIST in Kenosha, we continued because of our medical business. Uh, so although we were running at about a... Uh, 15 to 20% capacity, we still were shipping every week because we had this medical business. Um, so, uh, but from that standpoint, we also uh, tried to balance out to make sure we kept our people uh, engaged. Uh, we didn't send everybody home. Uh, we had workers that could come in and work. Uh, we did look to see how could we best utilize our office workers and <laughs> actually people, we, we, we have, we have a number of uh, conference rooms that are now individual offices uh, because we had people that were in cubicle areas and we said, let's just have everybody have their own separate office. And we did that as much as we could. Uh, other people that had the wherewithal, like the sales team that could work from home, uh, they come in a couple of days a week and work from home more often. Uh, so it's, it's been a really of a case by case. Uh, so although we kept working at assist, uh, ATF uh, and others really had the orders dry up and uh, and and had to uh, be flexible to that standpoint as well. My understanding is that uh, some companies were able, uh, the ones that were labeled non-essential for a while, were able to negotiate with either the federal, state, or local uh, uh, government entities to at least keep the plant open for at some capacity. The reason being, you know, why pay people to furlough them and go home and take a vacation when it could be shown that by their operating safely in the plant, uh, they'd be making uh, all of Mexico a lot safer. So uh, I guess there's been some of that going on as well. Uh, another question, uh, you said that, uh, you know, 20% of what you make in Kenosha was going down to Mexico and you're also shipping to Brazil. Uh, your, your parent company, AOT and uh, ATF, uh, they are being German. Uh, are they shipping to Europe at all? It is uh, I'm sorry. Is is uh, the joint venture shipping from Mexico to Europe? Yeah. Uh, there's a few opportunities for there, but the, their focus is really North America. Okay. Well, because of the footprint that AIT, uh, uh has, uh, they're a global company as well. Uh, so it's really trying to be regional and support the regions as best as possible. And that includes uh, China, includes India, includes Brazil. Uh, but there's really so much. Fortunately for our team at uh, uh, ATF and SLP, there is so much opportunity here in, in North America. Uh, they don't need to, if they, if they can, they will uh, ship to Europe, but that's really not their main focus because they've got plenty to keep some, that keeps them busy here. Okay. Uh, Manuel, are you still on? 
Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, uh, Fernando, are you still on? Yes, I'm still here. <laughs> okay, uh, I wanted to ask a question. I mean, obviously, uh, when uh, you know 2017 started, and uh, the president made it very clear that uh, the the NAFTA was a bad agreement, and we had to go to something uh, different. Uh, you've been working a long time in order to get to July 1st and the implementation of the USMCA. Uh, obviously, one of uh, the president's goals was uh, to curtail uh, North American companies, especially U.S. companies, in investing abroad to manufacture and bring more stuff back. Um, but as we're finding out, and uh, Fernando, you mentioned this and we talked about this before, uh, the Chinese, of course, are getting very interested now, particularly with the auto industry, trying to get uh, under the umbrella and uh, investing uh, a lot in, in Mexico, particularly in the industrial park area. Uh, do, do you see this, uh, uh, Fernando, and particularly Manuel, do you see this as a growing trend where uh, Chinese tier one, two, and threes uh, are now going to be trying to locate in Mexico or maybe even the United States? Do you want to answer, Fernando? Or, or go, go ahead, Manuel, go ahead. Okay. What, what I'm seeing is that the, there are some Chinese companies starting to come to, to Mexico. Maybe in the last uh, year, year and a half, we have been receiving companies that are interested in, in, in starting operations in Mexico. But what I, I, I'm, I'm seeing is that there are okay. they are willing to come and establish operations in Mexico. OEMs that maybe today they are something more in the Latin American market to build their cars here in Mexico and to supply to their markets that today they are buying cars from China, like Chile, like Peru, Colombia. Uh, these, these countries they buy uh, cars from China and they, they want to establish operations in Mexico because they can uh, build their cars here and sell, sell them in South America without duties. So there are certain uh, tier ones and tier two that has seen coming down to Mexico, mainly tier ones and not so many. Uh, today, I think that the, the trend is more the OEMs that are thinking of to establish operations in Mexico. Maybe they, they'll have to, to work with their cars to comply with the safety regulations in the US if they are willing to enter to the American market. But the first target of them is to supply South America from Mexico. Okay. Fernando, do you have any comments on that? Uh, just complementing what, what Manuel said, I think that's that's very important. Let's not forget that, that Mexico, apart from uh, our, our North American or USMCA, we have uh, free trade agreements, uh, very modern, very similar to the one that Canada has with Europe. Mexico has one. Mexico did sign to the to the TPP with Canada, and we 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 don't know if the Biden administration will come along. And of course, uh, 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 the Pacific Alliance in South America. So Mexico is an important trampoline for for the different companies to come. Notwithstanding that, the fact that uh, foreign companies, uh, including the Chinese, are putting industrial parks in our in our countries and in, in, in our in our countries, well, that means that uh, that's a big domino of important uh, ramifications for more jobs in, in North America. So I, I wouldn't see it as a danger as a danger per se. But um, our, our friends on the on the market, they are the experts. From a political viewpoint, I think that would be the intended consequences of 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 of, of raising the rules of origin and the tariffs. Uh, Dan, uh, do you hear any stuff from your clients at all about uh, their concern about uh, the Chinese now maybe coming in uh, and uh, competing with them directly here in North America? Well, I think there's a concern, but but I also think what we're looking at going forward is is perhaps more coordination between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico in dealing with that issue in terms of Instead of one country going it alone, but actually aligning. We've already done that on steel and aluminum to some degree in terms of not only the rules in USMCA, but um, setting up a monitoring mechanism, et cetera. Pe trade purists may not like it, but but managed trade is, is somewhat the order of the day at this point. So I, I actually think we'll see more collaboration in, in North America as opposed 
um, to the to the path that we were on, and ultimately, but but at the end of the day, like uh, as as others have said, um, you know, we represent a number of Chinese companies. That they're going to invest in North America. They they see the writing on the wall as well, um, and so in some cases, that can provide opportunities for joint ventures and other types of things. But it's it's going to be an interest. It's there, undoubtedly we're seeing a a change in procurement and and sourcing. Um, in a way that we just haven't um, in, in the last 10, 15, maybe even longer years, that people are understanding North America is, is where to be and to do exactly what Paul and others have said, is to use the trade networks that we already have uh, via Mexico and Canada and elsewhere. Um, following on from that, in uh, 2016, uh, ProMexico, and we remember them, uh, actually, uh, Rocio, you are now the ProMexico <laughs> in Mid-America. Uh, we're working with the, uh, the consulate very closely on, uh, on, on companies that want to go to Mexico. But four years ago, uh, they did a, a research project that resulted in uh, two charts, which I'll send to everybody, uh, looking at uh, the uh, production uh, cost of, of parts of vehicles, parts and subassemblies of vehicles uh, in probably 10 or 20 different categories and showing uh, the great investment opportunity that still existed uh, for companies to go to Mexico, especially when the average was maybe like around 40%. You know, there was still 60% left that uh, companies from uh, North America and around the world could invest in. Um, you know, this is still an opportunity that I see. Um, you know, obviously, um, you know, we, we can get to uh, the opportunities that are available. I know we've all talked about them. But I know uh, uh, four weeks ago, uh, our Bar National had a board meeting and both ambassadors Landau and Barsana uh, were talking about what they see going forward. And I think both of them uh, were a little concerned that, uh, they, they, you know, they were eager to see, uh, you know, more and more happen uh, now that maybe, uh, you know, COVID may be on the, on the downturn. Obviously, it's still going to take a while uh, and that uh, the investment will come back. Uh, so I, I guess, uh, you know, Paul, uh, your company has seen the opportunity. You know, you've bitten the bullet and you're moving forward. Uh, do we all see uh, uh, great opportunities for uh, tiers one, two, and threes uh, to still move to Mexico? Well, I, I believe so. And uh, I think it was underlined as well with the, um, I, I really appreciated the point earlier that was mentioned that uh, NAFTA was really focused on OEMs and tier ones. Uh, and now this is actually getting a nice trickle down effect to uh, the tier twos and tier threes, uh, as well as material suppliers. Um, and, and it's correct in saying that the, the $16 hour, dollar an hour wage doesn't necessarily affect us directly, uh, probably will be indirectly, but it's that's really uh, effect to the OEMs. Um, I, it, it's very interesting to me with uh, our current customer base um, that we ship around the world, who are in Mexico as well, they're really very happy uh, that we're coming because it makes their lives a lot a lot easier. And we asked a number of times to the purchasing directors and such, why is that? Is there some is there some underlying benefit that we're not quite understanding? Logistics has something to do with it, uh, for sure. Um, but then it also just makes their lives easier with a uh, lower amount of uh, inventories that they have to have. Um, so I think it's just a, an overall combination of all of these things that, that'll be underlined more with the USMCA uh, and help out the whole, the, the industry as a whole. Um, and I, I would see not only with our customers that we have, but we have target customers that are also excited that we're there uh, because they need more options and more opportunities for uh, for the types of suppliers that we are. Um, so I, to answer your question uh, shortly and saying yes, I think there'll be ongoing uh, positive impact uh, to Mexico uh, for new companies to move in. We're getting close to the end of our time. Uh, uh, the rest of the speakers, do you have any final comments you want to make or uh, you know a couple of thoughts that you want to leave with everybody? I mean, we still have 36 people that are watching us right now. 
Yeah, I just want to mention, Ralph, there's a trend to, uh, the globalization now is turning into regionalization. No, that's the end of the game. So uh, today we have this opportunity to work together between the three countries because regionalization is a reality today. Globalization today is not any more there. Okay, anybody else? Well, if not, uh, Rocio, we want to thank you and Carla and uh, the ambassador for all the hard work you're doing. Uh, and we still have a lot to, to go forward. Ambassador, do you have uh, any final words you want to say to the group? I'm sorry, Ralph. I, I, I kind of um, had to step out of the meeting for, for, for a while. Um, it's crazy times, you know, but uh, I really appreciate, again, your leadership in this issue. I think this is an, an uh, area of utmost importance for the uh, changes, changes in the three countries. And uh, uh, any opportunity we have to discuss and further understand all the implications of the new framework that we have with USMCA is going to be of benefit for, for the industry and for the consumers at the end of the day. So I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you to all the participants and my, my colleague, Fernando, for, for being here. Okay, uh, from me in the chamber, Feliz Navidad, the Prospero Año Nuevo. But in addition to hopefully economically being a prosperous year, we want it to be a safe and healthy year for everybody. So thank you all for participating. Uh, the uh, presentations that we were not able to, uh, to show you, we will uh, send you. We have also uh, recorded uh, this session. So uh, you can play it over and over again uh, when there's nothing on TV to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, guys and gals, thank you very much for coming and all the speakers. Thank you for all your hard work in putting this together and we're going to continue. Thank Thanks you very much, everybody. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a blast. Hasta luego.